All right, folks, I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Colin Starger. I am a professor of law here at UB, and I'm very proud to uh, serve as the moderator for the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, the discussion is about junk science and the American criminal justice system, which completely uncoincidentally is the title of a book that has just been released by uh, our honored guest, uh, Chris Fabricant. And, uh, and he will be speaking today here. He's on a book tour right now. So if you can't get enough of this and you want to hear more, tonight at Greedy Reads in Remington, uh, there'll be an official book party there where you could actually get a copy of the book. We don't have copies of the book for sale today. Um, but it's great to see students and faculty, and we have a, an honored uh, guest here as well, uh, a few of them. Um, it's the last week of, last full week of school, so appreciate you for taking your time uh, to come um, and join us in this conversation. I uh, want to say a couple of very quick thank yous. Thank you to Chris Stutz uh, for helping to organize this event. Thank you to Katie Ross for making sure uh, that we are, you are all fed, uh, and, uh, and thanks to all of you for coming to this. Um, the idea today is for us to have a strategic conversation about how to seek justice in face of systems that overwhelmingly seem designed to perpetuate injustice and inequality. And one of the great things about innocence is that often you are actually able to expose injustice and show uh, the way things went wrong and in individual cases, correct it at least to some degree, right? Um, uh, years stolen can never be given back, um, but, but public acknowledgements of wrongs can happen and it's very, very powerful. Uh, and so, uh, the law is something that we're particularly interested here in a law school, and you will have a, an excellent panel of lawyers who will help discuss the role of law in exposing these particular kinds of injustice. So the basic plan is I'll very briefly introduce the panelists, and then we'll move to kind of a Q&A right from the beginning, although I'll give Chris a chance to um, uh, talk about the book in very general terms. But as, as you'll see, there are three stories of particular wrongful convictions that occurred because of junk science, all in capital cases uh, that Chris uses as the, the backbone to tell the story. He was involved in, in helping expose those cases, each and every one of them. But it's symptomatic of a larger problem of racist policies that lead to mass incarceration. And the book really dives deeply into those underlying policies. So it's, it's a remarkable um, uh, work and I commend the actual book to all of you. Um, but as I said, uh, I'd like to introduce the, pa the panelists and I'd say they all have long and glittering CVs, right? But I'm not gonna go into all of their long and glittering CVs. And the reason is this, all three of these folks here are litigators. They actually do and have got in the courts and What's important to them isn't pomp and circumstance. What's important to them is getting the work done. So I'm gonna be relatively brief, but as I said, you could find out a lot more about these worthy folks um, uh, if you just used Google, I promise. Uh, but Chris Fabricant is the Director of Strategic Litigation at the Innocence Project. Uh, he has over 20 years of criminal experience, the trial level, appellate level. He's been a clinical professor, and I'm honored to say that I've known Chris as a friend for many, many years. And he is, of course, the author of this book. Uh, Menka Sena on the, uh, the far left there is the newly, in, well, relatively new, uh, uh, director of the Criminal Defense Clinic down the street at the University of Maryland. She's been there since 2019. She was a public defender at one of the most highly esteemed public defender services in the country, the PDS in Washington, D.C., for over 10 years, where she was a senior advisor to the agency director on forensic science issues. She's an expert in junk science rights in that area. And of course, our very own Erica Suter, Professor Suter, who's the director of the Innocence Project here at UB uh, since 2020. I got that right. 
since 2021, relatively recently, again, uh, it's a unique collaboration with the Office of the Public Defender. So she works with you. She works with UB students to free those wrongfully convicted and advocate for policy reform. Uh, and she came to UB with over 15 years of criminal defense experience, uh, most recently in private practice where she rightfully earned a reputation as an absolute dogged defender um, uh, and advocate for those who have been wrongfully convicted. And we are very, very happy that she is with us at our school. So that's who you've got. Uh, and, uh, and I would like to just start by maybe asking Chris, if you could tell us a little bit about what Judge Science is uh, and some of the stories that kind of anchor, anchor the book. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Colin, and the rest of the UB staff for inviting us all. I um, So I try to be very careful about how I define junk science because it's a pejorative term, and the people that are doing forensic sciences hate it and take great umbrage with the, with the, the phrase junk science. So what I said in, after the, the first story begins with Keith Harward's story, and then we're beginning with chapter one, I try to put on the page exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about junk science. What I said there is that it's subjective speculation masquerading as scientific evidence. It's something that sounds scientific, but it doesn't have any empirical basis. It doesn't have valid scientific research underlying the opinions. It hasn't been demonstrated to be reliable. It's something that has typically emerged from a crime scene rather than a crime laboratory or a scientific laboratory. And it's usually used to solve one particular crime then becomes a technique that worked once, gets, work, gets into the case law, and, you know, like a virus, it spreads around our justice system. And once it's admitted in case law, it's very, very hard to overturn that decision. So judges, when they're thinking about introducing or, uh, uh, scientific evidence or they're considering a challenge to the proper scientific evidence, they're typically not going to go to the literature, to the scientific literature. They're not going to go to the scientists. What they're going to do is so what you're all learning right now is they're gonna do some Westlaw research and they're gonna see whether or not this particular technique has been used before and is it admissible? And that will be usually the beginning and the end of the research that's done. And I think that all of us sitting up here would know this to be true is that the amount of scientific illiteracy that is widespread in the United States, but certainly also amongst lawyers and you know the old joke about going to law school because there's no math, I can see some of you smiling already, right? It still holds, but you gotta eat your broccoli because what happens is that you get junk science convictions as a result. And the so really that's what I mean by junk science. And what I was trying to do to accomplish with the book through, as Professor Starger mentioned, is like three clients that I helped represent are kind of the backbone stories and really through their stories to learn some of the efforts that this country has taken after the founding of the Innocence Project and really the development of forensic DNA which showed all of these techniques to be really fundamentally unreliable, whereas before they were thought to be, you know, really infallible and are depicted as infallible. So I wanted to put a human face, uh, client stories behind, you know, to educate kind of a mass audience, people that aren't like you, that are lawyers, that are becoming lawyers, that would be maybe inherently interested anyway. But we all know about True crime procedurals are very, very, you know, popular. And, you know, the way that we all learn as human beings, um, almost anything is storytelling. And so that's what I've tried to do with the book is tell stories. But I don't know if, like, my definition of junk science is differs from either of yours. I, uh... um, I could start. I don't, I don't think that it differs. I think it's helpful when you're starting to learn about it and you're starting to look for it in your cases and when you hear the news or you're hearing about things in real life, I think it's helpful to kind of break it up into different pieces. And so I break it up into three different pieces. One is just stuff like, like many of the disciplines described in the book that have never been validated at all, or they've been affirmatively established to not be valid, like white mark, for example. I think we forget that as, as, technology grows and evolves, we are going to be continued to face the problems described in the book over and over and over again, regardless of the technology. And so there are methods that are sort of theoretically reliable that can be used in unreliable ways, pushed past their limits, right? So you're not going to use a COVID test to test for something that's not COVID. It's not going to work in that scenario. And that's the same with all forensic disciplines. They, 
For example, DNA, single source DNA, that you think of that as good, reliable science. But when I touch this table and you take a swab and then Chris touches it and Erica touches it and Colin touches it, and you try to test this tiny, tiny, tiny amount of DNA and try to move the swab out of the sun for three weeks, that's a much more difficult problem than you bring my finger so I think one is stuff that's just junk, like the invalid, speculative, subjective stuff. Two is when you misapply things and push them back to the limit. And three, I think, is where you take something and you make unsupported conclusions about it. So, for example, I think these two fingerprints are consistent with each other. That might be an okay statement, but they match to the exclusion of all others. There's no scientific support for that. So I like to break it up into those pieces because all of those who are science end up as junk science presented against them that harms them and they need to be more I would just before I pass back to you, I would just add or you know, building upon what um, what Mika just said is that, and I would agree with that definition, is that the you know what we get is something like also the firearms and tool marks. You know, is that there's you know probably a there there to say that you know a certain um, class of gun fired a particular type of bullet, but what you see day in day out being somebody is testifying right now that that bullet was fired from that gun to the exclusion of every other gun manufactured in the history of time, right? There's no empirical basis for that testimony, but it's been accepted in case law for 100 years. So that's kind of what we're also battling against. You know, what I mean, so when you have close cases. And that's the only evidence, and you're gilding the lily like that, you know. I mean, that's a misleading statement that's introduced to scientific evidence, and it's routine. And many different large scientific, our most prestigious scientific organizations in this country, the National Academy of Sciences, has said such a such testimony is not scientifically defensible. There's no basis for it, and yet it continues to be exist. I don't know. Just provide the speakers because we're Thanks, Chris. Can um okay. Vicky comes through again. What are we gonna do without you, Vicky? Um so obviously I, I agree very much with. Uh, what my fellow panelists have said, and I sort of think about junk science as kind of science with an end game, right? And it's distinct from actual sort of reliable science in that many of these disciplines were conceived for the purpose of getting a conviction. And just practically speak, so that in and of itself is not sort of scientifically reliable. And practically speaking, when you're in a courtroom, it's like when Chris says, you got to eat your broccoli, it's so important because it's sort of like, for many lawyers and judges who used to be practicing lawyers, you hear science stuff and everybody sort of blanks out and just wants to rely on the experts. And when you've got experts with an agenda, it, some really incredibly dangerous things can happen. And to this day, you know, you think about something like bite marks and it seems like something that's in the past and that we all know better. But every day in courtrooms around the country, this sort of unreliable science is used. And, you know, obviously the Innocence Project with all of its DNA exonerations is a testament to the amount of damage that can be done when we sort of blindly trust experts in the courtroom and we don't sort of, you know, push back on, on um, the unreliability of it. Yeah, I just want to add something as far as, you know, to, to cop to my own inadequacies as a young public defender, when I was a baby public defender and I would be confronted with scientific or alleged scientific evidence, you know, I wasn't, you know, pushing back on it necessarily. I wasn't thinking about challenging and I was thinking about what? Changing my trial theory, right? Or looking for a plea, you know? And I remember my first day at the Innocence Project was the, the 2012 FBI hair microscopy scandal was unfolding right here in DC or near here in DC. And, you know, what I learned, you know, like by starting there is that the FBI and its agents out of the FBI crime lab and those that they had trained had been overstating the significance of hair comparison evidence for a century, a century. So talking about thousands of cases that had gone on and I gulped, you know, reminding myself of pleas I had taken in hair cases, you know, I mean, not knowing better, you know, what I mean, so I think one thing I want to just like 
message to you as young students is that lawyers are the most skeptical people that I know, right? Except for when it comes to scientific evidence, right? So be skeptical, right? There's almost nothing is infallible. And as Minka just pointed out, like a lot of the, the new probabilistic genotyping testing that's having, you know, five, six samples of the mixture DNA, you say DNA, people also blank out. It's like, okay, well, that must be reliable. So retain your skepticism. I'm just going to take a step back because I have a feeling that some of the students in the audience might not know that the book is centered around three cases where wrongful convictions were largely secured on the basis of bite marks. And bite marks are, uh, as the name suggests, that uh, uh, some injury or bruise is seen on someone's skin, including the skin of somebody that's been dead and, and buried and exhumed in, in some instances. And uh, an expert comes in, uh, the so-called forensic odontologists, who are the sort of the villains of this particular book, uh, and, uh, and say, that is a perfect match to these teeth that the, the defendant has, right? And then they'll throw out all sorts of statistics and it's just wrong. Um, it's, it's been proven in many, many instances. And so the book is centered around that. That's the, the um, archetypal instance of junk science. Uh, but the panelists have also mentioned hair comparison evidence where saying two hairs uh, clearly came from the same person. They use old and, and terrible racial categories sometimes to describe those hairs. Turns out they think that something they said that came from an African-American was actually from an animal and different, different examples like that. So the book dives a lot deeper into it. I just I think that um, we've got some of the basic terms we might need to uh, explain to folks. Um, but I'm going to throw it back to you, to Chris, because you had, in addition to calling it junk science, for the reasons that um, Eric and Mink had described in, in greater detail, you've also called it poor people's science. So, uh, and that relates back to a larger theme of the book. So maybe you can explain a little bit about that. Uh, you know, so I, um, you know, the, the, the legal system in the United States has exploded in the 70s and 80s when largely the result of mass incarceration in the drug war on the criminal side and on the civil side, it was personal injury litigation, mass torts litigation, product liability type litigation. So you had this exponential growth of our legal system, and it created really a cottage industry of expert witnesses. People, that wasn't like a career that you could go into before, but now there are people that's all they do is testify as experts in criminal cases. I mean, in civil cases in particular, to a lesser extent, it's true also in criminal cases, and usually they don't um, testify in both. And what was happening in the, the late 70s and, and throughout the 80s is that a lot of corporations were getting sued and getting and losing multi-zillion dollar verdicts. And a lot of it was based on speculative expert witness testimony. A lot of it was righteous too, right? You know, the Ford Pinto type litigation, you know, or that. But there was also a lot of speculation that was unwarranted and it was being admitted in civil trials and corporations were losing a lot of money. And so what happened is they teed up a case to get to the Supreme Court to change the way that judges were required to um, consider like the proffer of scientific evidence. Used to be, and still is in many places, including New York and California and other places that have the so-called Fry test, where you defer to the relevant scientific community and you count noses and you say, well, if everybody in that community generally accepts this, you know, technique is valid and reliable, then I, who am I? I'm a judge. I, we will accept it, right? And so there, and this is something that I kind of explore a little bit in the book, is what would happen is that you would have the relevant scientific community is defined by the proponents of the actual technique, you know, those who are making their living doing it, right? So if you ask somebody who's making their living whether or not hair microspecy is good science, you know, the answer that you're going to get is pretty predictable, right? Of course, it's generally accepted. But if you asked mainstream scientists and statisticians if that were true, you would get an entirely different answer. And nobody asked for a very, very long time. But so that was Fry. So that was happening both in civil and criminal cases. But the corporate uh, defendants were tired of it. They teed up this case to the, the United States Supreme Court called Daubert. Um, it looks like it should be Daubert. I know people who know the Dauberts. <laughs> That's the way they pronounce it. The right, yeah, it's kind of right. You know, it's, I've been corrected a bunch of times. Okay. It's like, yeah, it's, it's actually Dabber. I'm not <laughs> right. 
And so in that case, uh, it was a product liability case. It was civil. It was about a prenatal uh, drug that women were taking to prevent nausea um, um, from morning sickness. And um, it was alleged to have um, caused birth defects. It turns out it probably didn't. But this was uh, the case that was brought to the Supreme Court. And in that case, the court decided that judges are no longer going to defer to the relevant scientific community. They're going to have to eat their broccoli, right? And they're going to have to apply, you know, these five factors, not exclusive, but generally became kind of exclusive that will test, you know, it's basic principles of science, like whether it's been peer reviewed, whether or not your hypothesis is testable, right? And whether or not it's also general acceptance is one of the categories. So they're going to apply this test to the proper scientific evidence and exclude unreliable evidence, reliability being the key here, right? And so what happened after this, the criminal like side of the docket wasn't even discussed in the case, although the standard would apply to both. What happened after Daubert was, was uh, handed down and states adopted it around the country is that there was an empirical study done in the 90s by my uh, boss, Peter Neufeld, one of the co-founders of the Innocence Project, that showed that it was working. In civil cases, unreliable evidence is being excluded at a rate that had never been seen before, right? Judges were excluding speculative opinions. But on the criminal side, nothing had changed at all. Zero. And I did a follow-up study with Brandon Garrett in 2018 that showed nothing had changed despite all the wrongful convictions 20 years later. And so the idea, you know, of poor people science is, is that we care as a society much more about getting the science right when money is at stake than when life and liberty are at stake. And the difference, you know, speaks to our values as a society, right? Because who is being prosecuted in our criminal courts today? marginalized communities, overrepresented by black and brown people. And this is one of the tools that is used to maintain the status quo. And so they get poor people science. And we see many, many uh, examples of that throughout the book. And that's why I use that phrase, because to be clear, I don't think anybody up here thinks that junk science is the leading problem associated with our criminal legal system, right? Junk science is a symptom of a much larger disease of systemic racism and mass incarceration. And this is one of those tools. Uh, uh, Menko, Eric, would you like to kind of offer your thoughts on why it's important to look at something like junk science in order to understand the problems of inequality that, that Chris was alluding to, or some connection to that general theme? Um, yeah, so I, I actually think that both Erica and Chris made really, really important points. And one of the things that, one of my favorite parts about the book, um, is the way it, it does a very nice job of, of trying to connect this problem with junk science with the broader problem of mass criminalization. And I say mass criminalization, not mass incarceration, because it's much more than a problem of imprisonment. It's, it's, a, whole, it's a wholesale start to finish every aspect of the criminal legal system being expanded more people being stopped on the street, more people being searched, more people being arrested, more people. Um, being charged, more people being charged with serious crimes, more people getting bad plea offers, more people are interested. It's the whole thing from start to finish. And I will be honest, I have found in practice that I don't, I have felt that people treat forensics as something different, like some little bubble, like a cleanser that cleans up the rest of the mess of the criminal legal system. If we have forensics, we have this bing, bing, bing match whatever else happened, whatever else problematic conduct was undertaken by the police or the prosecutors, we can look past that because we have forensics. And they both sort of alluded to, that's not true at all. These things are entirely interwoven. And so one of the things that I started to study and learn about is exactly the thing that Erica started mentioned in her first um, comment, which is all of these things that we think are super scientific, most of them were not the product of scientific research or, 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 or work in labs. It, the book traces this nicely, really nicely with some of these disciplines. They were developed by and for policing and prosecution. So a lot of the tools that we have were sort of developed decades, if not hundreds of years ago, but we see this massive proliferation of them along the exact same period that we see mass incarceration. So 
there's this feeling in like the 60s that we're we're the, the country is facing this massive crime problem, right? Civil rights era, there's a lot of unrest, and there's a feeling that there's a lot of a lot more crime. And we changed the way we do crime policy forevermore in the 60s. So we moved from localized crime policy, every jurisdiction is doing it by themselves, to nationalized crime policy, which is what we know now. We start to distribute money to local jurisdictions to do policing, um, and as everyone here is probably familiar with, the most sort of notable aspect of that is the war on drugs. So what happens? We're pouring money into these local jurisdictions, do policing, let's do more policing, and let's develop labs. Let's develop technologies. Let's start recovering evidence from crime scenes. So we get these labs. They start focusing on drug crimes, but they start to build up all of these other techniques that are now ubiquitous in the criminal system. And so this integration of these things, this idea that forensics is something separate and that it's not true, it's actually part of this problem of over-criminalization is, I think, something that all of us need to pay a little bit more attention to. And one of the things that's so nice about the book is that it sort of makes clear how integrated they are. So that's my brief expansion on that. <laughs> um, well, I think I'll start with a little bit of good news that Maryland is now, as of recently, relatively recently, a Dal 2020, yeah, Dalbert jurisdiction, Dalbert, how the hell am I saying? <laughs> Dalbert? Uh, jurisdiction. And so both attorneys in the Office of the Public Defender and in private practice have been successful with excluding um, some of this junk science as of recently. Um, so that, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to have some CLEs to sort of expand that body of knowledge so that we can start pushing back against some of this and not sort of blindly accepting. Um, on the, I guess, on the bad news side, um, when Chris talks about it being sort of poor people science, right? Um, Maryland is fortunate in that we have a very robust um, office of the public defender with some resources to be able to hire experts. And oftentimes these experts will um, sometimes, you know, reduce their, their services, but experts are expensive. And, um, you know, sometimes they'll reduce their services to work with an innocence project, to work with the office of the public defender. But having come from, I've come from many, many years in private practice, and but post conviction work specifically. So I'll be looking back at attorneys work in private practice often who did not get an expert. They just thought, OK, well, maybe I can sort of cross this expert on gunshot residue or some other thing. And they weren't prepared because these things cost money. It costs money to educate yourself. It costs money to call your own expert. And so when we talk about it being a poor people's problem, I mean, it, it, it really, really is because resources can make all the difference. You do that in your book when you're talking about one particularly well-resourced defendant versus another, and the outcomes are so different because it comes down to money. Um, so that, I mean, that is really sort of where we see it. And we see also that this science, you know, isn't, you know, people think that science is neutral and it's blind to race and it's blind to poverty, but that is not the case. How it is applied, who it gets applied to, who is in a position to push back, who a judge will believe when it's pushed back against often comes down to issues of economics and class as well as race. Yeah, I just want to build a little bit on um, things you both said. One is that um, in terms of the forensic sciences being part of a whole, couldn't agree with that more. And something that the National Academy of Sciences pointed out and what we've been advocating for for a long time is the separation of crime labs from law enforcement. Right. There's subjectivity in all forensics, DNA down the line. There is nothing that's completely objective. And so when you have subjectivity, you have bias, implicit and explicit bias. And you have a lot of folks that came from law enforcement, from being a regular detective and then graduating into a crime lab. And so when you have experts, forensic practitioners who have a mindset that they're in the business of catching bad guys rather than just doing science, then you have that problem perpetuated. It's just another arm of law enforcement and science can't be that, you know, so that I just wanted to emphasize um, something that Minkin said. And then the, the other piece that I think was important, and I think you're right, as far as being well-resourced uh, defendants who are certainly in a much better position to challenge unreliable evidence. But I write about a Fry hearing that we did in New York that we participated in in 2012. And this is in Manhattan. This isn't, you know, in the middle of nowhere, right? It was 100 Center Street. And it was bite mark evidence. 
And, you know, what they did, you know, in that case is, is, you know, they presented a forensic practitioner who has 20 years of experience in bite marks, a forensic dentist from Texas. And he went on for a couple of days about how they do bite mark analysis and how it had been successfully used in the Ted Bundy case and all these other cases they talked about without talking about any of the underlying lack thereof of research. And then you have Dr. Karen Kafadar, who's a total genius, right? And has been, you know, tenured in like three different colleges, he worked for NASA, Department of Defense, he's on NAS, you know what I mean? It's like Albert Einstein descending into the courtroom and saying that bite marks are nonsense. And the judge credited the Texas dentist in Manhattan, right? So this speaks to the biases that we're all dealing with. And that's why we must have upstream fixes on forensics that separate from the criminal legal system entirely, because trying to separate junk science from real science in the adversarial process is a loser. It, it almost never works. None of us are going to cross-examine your way out of a junk science conviction. It doesn't happen. So that's a perfect transition to the question that I want to ask. Next, we've sort of established that people in white coats aren't just truth tellers objectively laying down what happened. They're subject to a lot of uh, biases that lawyers can't fall asleep when they're hearing them, that they need to push back. The eat the broccoli seems to be the dominant metaphor that we're, that we're using for that. But what about the law? I mean, in your book, you alluded to it just now. There, uh, there are victories um, uh, uh, on an individual sense that, that have certainly occurred that are very, very important. And yet the case law itself seems stubbornly resistant to change. And, and prosecutors um, that are highlighted in, in this book and, and not, I don't want to generalize uh, too much, but certainly it's, it's a, not an isolated problem. So the sort of prosecutorial overreach and judicial resistance to change seems to be a problem here. So. Do you think that the what is the role of the law, uh, or how do you see the law as playing into, you know, being able to fix from within the system, or do you have to leave the system out? I, I imagine that everybody up here will agree that the law has been a disaster as far as um, policing, you know, scientific evidence goes. I, um, it's you know, I'm, I'll tell you a story that's a contemporary story that's not in the book, but it relates to everything that we're talking about here. Is that what I? One thing I did in the book is I traced the original bite mark case, the 70s case in California, that was the first time bite mark evidence had been introduced in any criminal court um, as far as a bite mark on human skin goes, or was actually in cartilage. But the um, And you could see the reasoning of this. The judge, it was a bench trial. The judge said, this is such simple stuff. I can see with my own eyes whether or not this is going to be a match or not a match. This isn't the kind of whiz-bang technology that we need to be really careful with, that jurors are going to be misled by. This is just kind of pattern matching techniques. So I'm going to admit this evidence. I'm going to admit it. I'm not even going to scrutinize it as alleged scientific evidence. I'm saying there's no science here, but I'm going to admit this as like technical expertise. And it was used, it got a conviction of a guy who looked to be guilty. So that reasoning gets picked up, and that's the germinal case in bite marks. And it gets picked up in all the subsequent cases that cite it. And the Professor Starger, like, you know, he, he made a fancy graphic for me with his data scientists. It showed how it spread around the country like a virus. And what was really the pernicious influence of this case is really easily tracked in that sense because it becomes scientific evidence, even though the first one they said it wasn't science, you know what I mean? Now we're calling it scientific evidence. You can see that it's never actually challenged in a Fry test. And this reasoning of it being just pattern matching and so simple that we really don't need to scrutinize it the way we would other scientific evidence gets picked up to admit other techniques that are pattern matching. Hair microstasy, tire tread, shoe prints, fingerprints, whatever, all these trace evidence techniques and shielded it from actual scrutiny that is barely applied anyway. So what that happens, and I talk about Mark Reed's case in Connecticut, where it's where the Connecticut Supreme Court picked up that reasoning for a hair microstasy case where the white victim accused the black defendant of rape and a hair microstasy um, anal analyst testifies that the negroid hair found on the white woman was, came, was consistent with coming from this black man when they did the DNA testing and turned out not only was it not Mark Reed's hair, it was the white victim's own hair, right? So they said that, you know, this reasoning that jurors could not be misled by this, you know, is obviously false. And then fast forward to a month ago, in a case that we're litigating, the Essence Project is litigating um, with the Southern Center for Human Rights, 
called, uh, it's Charles McCory's case in Alabama. And in that case, I'm just going to tell you here, he's innocent. There's lots of evidence of innocence. I'm not going to lay it all out for you. If you Google him, you know, you can find a couple of good articles about it. The, the main evidence that the only like alleged physical evidence in the case is bite mark evidence. And it was proffered by the same guy who testified in the Ted Bundy case and which made them all famous. And that finally, after a bunch of wrongful convictions and 30 years, he recanted his opinion entirely. So that was one of the bases that we used to go back into court. So we did a full, and right before we started this evidentiary hearing, and evidentiary hearings and post-conviction are kind of like trials. You have opening and closing statements, witnesses, a whole lot. You just don't have a jury. And right before we started that, the DA offered a time served plea to our client who had been in for 37 years. Walk home. All he has to do is admit guilt, right? Won't do it. We do the hearing. We lose the hearing. And he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison in all likelihood because it's in Alabama and it's very, very challenging to overturn that on, on appeal. And the reasoning that the court used to dismiss the significance of the recantation was because of this reasoning from the original bite mark case saying that this is so simple that you don't even need an expert right, to tell you. So the recantation didn't matter because the jury itself it comes to the same conclusion. Therefore, nothing new to see here. So this is really what we're talking about, how you know, this case is 40 years ago, and it's still keeping people in prison today. So the idea that we need to separate hate, like the legal system from the scientific research required to be using scientific evidence, I think is, you know, couldn't be more obvious. So is that just too depressing, Menka? Uh, <laughs> does, does that mean we should get out of this law gig entirely? Or what, what's, what's, how, how do you see the possibility of fighting for, for reform from within the law? I feel like I'm the wrong person. I don't no. look down on three of us. So I think it's like a both I couldn't agree more with first that the law guy that ever and fully failed. We were talking a little bit earlier about how American standards that the news also adopted more factors than the original five effort that's also good news. OPD has had success in keeping out some science for years. Also, they've, they've also walked under the new camera a number of times and really bad attention to it. So I don't think that's going to save us. I, the law is bad. I would say that I've litigated in this really a number of times. And the truth is, most of the time, I want judges won't be the new effect. So I want to do that's great. And I think that it's It'll work when a judge gives you a look and takes the standard seriously and those judges are few and far. Um, this is mentioned the study that did and there. I like that study was all I remember when it came out, I put in every motion, and part of the reason I put in every motion is I'm gonna judge that's not a judge. I got one to see that, right? So I think like yes, we let's bring it back to the line. I have a client. Who is dealing with John Sykes in his case? Yeah, I'm going to use the law and I'm going to try to keep the nail. He has to deal with this right now. I can't wait till he's whatever that happens to be. So, yes, we have to fight. We have to constantly be vigilant. We have to throw down all the other people that are disposal and the face of a judge. We have to do that. But I, I also agree that we need both front end of screen. And uh, back and downstream, we need to be getting every single angle that we can. Some of it is by like doing this, some of it is by like edu- educating the public that when you have jurors, jurors are much more critical than they have been traditionally, which is not critical at all. Some of it is, you know, we have to have lab separation for law enforcement. We have to do that in a way that's meaningful. We can't take a lab out of the Set it up as an independent job for all the people that were excluded by that company. I see an accomplice of training, the lack of training. You have to do it in a meaningful way. You have to have checks on the back. We need to be The book talks about how difficult it is once we're convicted to actually get released. It's not as if there's so many hurdles. We need to do reform in that. So it's really not a single. Single solution. 
clients at the center. And anything you want to want to add to that, Erica? Yeah, it's also not exactly the same. But um, no, I I hundred percent agree with Monika that you need to hit this on multiple fronts. We can't ignore sort of what's happening in the justice system, even if we're not sort of satisfied with where it is. We have to hit it on both fronts. But I don't even know. There's this really weird almost stain that's left in cases where junk science has been employed, where even though you have the thing, like you have the recanting witness who says this was not true. Um, you know, I had a case I was talking before the panel started, we were talking about, I had a case where the only evidence against the client was comparative bullet lead analysis. We now know that that is nonsense. And a jailhouse snitch who turned out to be a career FBI informant and it's still just getting us over. It's it's almost as if they say, OK, you know, we know that that's not true, but we still think he's guilty. And it's so much just because they've been through the process. It's almost like it leaves a stain in the mind of the court. And obviously, famously, in Adnan Syed's case, where we knew that that cell phone evidence that was used to corroborate really the only evidence against him, we all know that it's not real. It's not reliable. It doesn't stand for what it was put forth. And yet, you know, there's a belief that, well, he's here, he, he came through, he was charged, he was convicted, we don't want to disturb the jury's verdict. There's this weird sort of phenomenon that even when you can say affirmatively that this science is not sound and this was the basis of the conviction, look at the closing argument, the prosecution is hanging their hat on this evidence and now this evidence comes out, it still has a strange residual effect that you always have to push up against when you're challenging a conviction that drive towards finality um, is something that is more unique to the law than to science. Science doesn't have this principle of finality that they're trying to uh, establish and reestablish. Um, I want to uh, offer folks here the opportunity to, to ask any questions that they might have. Um, uh, yeah, you watch. Um, Chris, in your talk, you uh, twice alluded to the views of the National Academy of Science. Yeah. I wanted to know what's the role of that entity or the National Institute of Justice in certifying what is valid. I think we have a you know, food and drug administration that says this drug is effective and this one's not. We don't have individual pharmacists trying to decide and you know have arguments about what it is. It's a national uh, scientific certification. Why not? Well, there's a reason you're dean, right? Because you made such a wonderful point. I, I uh, um, is because, and you know, this is something that I've said during this tour a number of times is that we need something like the FDA for forensics, right? You know, on toothpaste, on aspirin, and any other consumer product that we have, this has to be scientifically tested and demonstrated reliable before it's unleashed on the consumer public, right? For self health and safety reasons, right? Nothing like that exist for forensics, right? Nothing, and you can be put to death on total speculation that there's no federal or state entity that signs off on it before it's actually used in a criminal trial. So we think about it in terms of what we've been advocating for is something like the National Institute of Standards and Technology to take up this role because it's the most kind of scientific oriented of the federal agencies that would be capable of doing this because they're all about measurement, right? Mm -hmm. And no measurements essentially are taken in forensics and measurement is the basis of most science. So yes, that's what we believe. And I think it's unimpeachable that we need such evidence because it takes it away from an individual criminal case, right? And it's like most of these decisions are around trying to prosecute a certain individual. And I think some of the biases that we've been talking about is that most people, jurors, judges, when you walk into the courtroom and you've got a defendant in the dock, believe that that person is guilty, right? That's like, you know, and most of the time they are. You know, if you were talking about a criminal system that arrests and prosecute more innocent people than not, then we're really in a lot of trouble. But if we're talking about like 1% of the 2.3 million people in various forms of incarceration in this country, then we're talking about tens of thousands of innocent people. So I'm not understating this problem either. But to your, your larger point, is that we have the National Academy of Sciences itself has to be, it was commissioned by Congress to undertake the study that produced the 2009 um, National Academy of Sciences report, which I spend some time discussing in the book. But that is kind of a one off, right? You know, I mean, they don't have a, a, a specific role. And then subsequently, the 2016 President Council of Advisors in Science and Technology, that what became known as PCAST, or I think it is still known as PCAST. 
was Obama's, um, the Obama administration took another look that followed up on the NAS report and came to very similar conclusions, you know what I mean? And, and to be very reductive, but it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning is that it says that there's no forensic technique, zero, that's capable of identifying the source of crime scene evidence to the exclusion of all other sources. And yet, again, it's being emitted every day. Any other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned how many people like you know, It's a great question. I'm sure that my co-panelists will also have thoughts on this one. But the, uh, yeah, as you know, I'm sure you know, overwhelmingly cases, you know, plead out that they don't actually go to trial. The cases that we talk about in my book are trial cases, big cases, homicides, you know, that kind of thing. But the day in, day out, you think about something like presumptive drug testing, right, which is notoriously unreliable, flipping a coin often, also subject to confirmation bias by police officers looking at a color and looking for the right color to come up. So a little pill is found in a car or some pipe that may or may not have marijuana, or I guess we're getting less of those types of arrests or crack or whatever, is that that person gets arrested, that person's in jail. And that person maybe has a criminal record already or can't afford to make bail or is going to be and is required to plead guilty in, other for, in exchange for his or her or their freedom, right? And so that's a junk science conviction. And those are lesion, you know what I mean? And, and they're never reported. They're never going to be found out. They're never going to be overturned absent some big scandal. So just the threat of of, you know, so-called scientific evidence can induce pleas. You know, in much bigger cases, you know, some of the cases that, that I do write about, you're talking about somebody who's being confronted with junk science in a capital case and saying, plead guilty and you'll get life, you know I mean? And we won't, you know, introduce this science against you. That's a whole different, you know, ballgame. So I, uh, on appeal, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's assumed reliable, but I'm sure that, yeah, I'm not sure if you have thoughts about, you know, the plea process as it relates to forensics. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I agree with Chris that there are so many pleas that are induced um, as a result of the forensic science. So it still sort of rears its ugly head. And I think the judges buy into it. Um, and the case that I was talking about where it came down to comparative bullet lead analysis and somebody and other Brady information because they didn't tell the trial attorney that the person was an informant and had gotten a benefit for being an informant. He testified falsely and said he was just doing the right thing. That client pled guilty to second degree murder because he wanted to go home. So it is still a huge problem. And even, and again, sort of referencing my comments earlier, it's difficult to move the needle with judges. So even though they're hearing, okay, this really isn't reliable, there is often this sort of undergirding belief that they still must be guilty because they've found themselves in this context. So they must have been doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, it is still, I think, a major problem in pleas and in sentencing as well. Yeah, I would just add a, a, a couple of small points. First, I want to compliment the question because you're homing in on a problem that literally took a decade to realize. No joke. So this problem of of this problematic technical junk science, carceral technology evidence at phases other than the trial phase is a big and real one for the exact reason you identified, which is most cases never go to trial. Right? Most 95 plus percent of cases are put out. And Dauber, this is this framework we've been talking about that regulates the admissibility of this type of evidence. The case is codified in a rule, codified in a rule of evidence here, Maryland 5 702 Federal Rule 702. That's a trial stage rule, right? It doesn't apply at sentencing. So basically, I'm imagining just a teeny teeny tiny bit, but basically, there's no regulation of this evidence at the sentencing stage. And because so many people plead, they're therefore sentenced, the crux of their day in court is sentencing. That's for adjudicator, that's for the judge's obviously make liberty determination. And there is tons of junk science, or sometimes fine science, but there's tons of that type of evidence at the sentencing stage, too. Hey, we got this guy's prints at these other crimes. Not, you didn't plead guilty to those, but we want you to know, Judge. 
Mm -hmm. Or in an example, a case I had, a very, very faulty risk assessment that our client was serious risk of future danger, totally misapplied. We tried to litigate it under Traverse. The judge was like, oh, that was really fine. That's insane, right? And you can take it back earlier. Think about the investigation phase. We use all of these predictive policing tools now. We use things like automated gunshot detection. Um, predictive technologies. We use those things to arrest people, right? to get them off the street, to turn them into the legal system, to prosecute them. Some of that stuff's not even coming in at trial. Right? They just use it to get the person. And then it's not actually introducing that at a trial, but it has a major impact on their life, right? Because that's how they develop the target. So the point is, I'm saying that you, you read the book, you've read about all the, all the disciplines that are in the book, you know the bite marks are bad, you know that our quote unquote science is bad, you know the hair marks are bad. But we need to be vigilant because it's constantly changing and it's not just used as one mm -hmm. slice of the legal system. Yeah, I would just add to something that, that Minka made a great point about investigative techniques is that often, you know, these junk sciences, you know, are originally used, well, this is just going to be for investigative techniques, right? We're going to develop a suspect, right? But then they're going to paint a bullseye around that suspect. But but beyond that is that this is how they get into like the ether, right? That you understand that this technique exists or that it's being used for investigative purposes. And then what you see is it slowly creeps its way into trials, into case in chiefs, where the, the standard should be beyond a reasonable doubt and it should be subject to Fry or Daubert and often isn't, right? We're seeing that in ShotSpotter. Right. So this technique that was developed so to justify really to aim police resources at alleged gunshots, right? And its reliability is very suspect. But what we're seeing now, and I know of at least three cases where prosecutors have wanted to use shot spotter evidence to establish the sequence of firing uh, of which gun was, was fired first, which was second, or that there were two calibers of gun, or that one was an automatic weapon. And that they're claiming now, or prosecutors are claiming the ability of this technology, what it wasn't designed for, which hasn't been validated for, but will be useful for this prosecution to bring in in that. And then suddenly it's in case law and we're off to the races, right? Then we don't even need to validate it, right? Because it's a point that I make in the case, in the book, is that most forensic techniques don't have that useful applications outside of criminal law, right? And so once it's been introduced in criminal cases, there's no real incentive to do any validation research because it's already accepted the only place where it matters in criminal trials, right? Unless you're just some righteous scientist that wants to, you know, know what they're actually talking about or validate your opinions, it's done once it's admitted. And so we see this, all these new whiz bang investigation techniques, there isn't anything that's only for investigation. You know what I mean? Like once you've like developed a suspect also, it's a very, very quick road to conviction. I think that I would like to pick up on just one point because we speaking about investigation, and this is one little hobby horse of mine. Um, we often say, because it's true, that 95% of cases plead out. However, for those of you that are students in the audience, that doesn't mean that 95% of people that are arrested um, are taking guilty pleas. Uh, a majority of those cases, certainly in, in Maryland, certainly in district court, but in other jurisdictions as well, get tossed out ahead of time entirely. In Maryland, it's called a, a null process, a null prosecute. And that's important to recognize because the carceral apparatus, um, the arrests of people is much, much larger um, uh, than what we're seeing the cases that even get adjudicated by guilty pleas. And these techniques are used as, um, as Benka and Chris were both describing uh, at some length in Erica as well, to identify those folks. And it can, and it can pull them into this system that it can be very difficult to get out of. Um, Chris. I was wondering if Thank you. 
I think the Maryland instruction is particularly awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I did not know that. So um, that was a nice feed to you. I didn't realize I was giving you the assist there, actually. Um, yeah, so I think there are in that in that space, and I think that many judges are open to them. I will say that I personally had some but minimal success getting good jury instruction before the jury. I've probably missed one. Um, I have not, uh, I haven't tried a case in 10 years, but the, uh, that said, I have consulted on a number of efforts to, um, have new jury instructions. And one of the ones that I think is that you might find, and I think is particularly useful because you would want to talk about it in void dear, and you'd want to talk about it in your opening statement and your closing statement is that what we're seeing more and more of, particularly in these jurisdictions that have, you know, more rigorous tests for introducing scientific evidence, is that some forensic practitioners or prosecutors are abandoning the mantle of science for the, so to get around, you know, this idea that it has to pass a Fry or a Dabber test and calling it just technical expertise, kind of going back to what we were talking about, the original bite mark case. And if that's so, then you have to ask for an instruction that this is not science, right? Nothing, and they, they're not allowed to call it science and instructions that say that it's not science and what good science would actually be, right? So they shouldn't be allowed to, you know, have their cake and eat it too, because often what happens is that, yes, they will be admitted because it's not technically scientific evidence. And then you'll be, you know, essentially called science. The person will call themselves a scientist when they're on the witness stand, the prosecutor will call it that in summation. And so you're getting it kind of both ways, you know what I mean? And that's really, I think, you know, grossly prejudicial. And I think that when you're pounding on this idea that it's not science, it's important for jurors to understand because every time you like think about what's advertised, it's scientifically tested, right? Demonstrated reliable. I mean, that's why, because people believe that. I feel like I should throw to you <laughs> uh, the, the pattern jury instruction. Well, I, I think... Um, so pattern jury instructions in different jurisdictions are constructed differently. And in, in, in Maryland, there's a committee of judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys um, and uh, one law professor that are involved in uh, writing these things. And but it's difficult to get, you know, really strong instructions through. It's very important to, um, to have a kind of balance there that can that can uh, appease all parties. So. Litigating jury instructions in particular cases, I think, is probably a more successful, larger strategy than than trying to change the pattern instruction. Um, and one thing I'll add, just drawing on my particular experience in Maryland, is to what you know, we have our model and uh, our pattern jury instructions, which you're not going to get you know a lot of pushback from the judge. But once you try to craft a non-pattern jury instruction that's specific to the facts of your case, whether or not the court is going to let you do that varies so much from judge to judge, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, what the local practice is. So there's not sort of uniformity as to sort of having the freedom to craft the right jury. Like some judges let you do it and some won't. Um, and that in and of itself can be a real challenge. So I know we didn't put a, a hard stop on the end of this, um, which was perhaps a failure of planning on my part. <laughs> um, um, but I suspect there might be one question is just shift away from um, the substantive content of what we're talking about to, to you as individuals. I know there's a lot of um, aspiring uh, lawyers out there. They're on, well on their way. And I know for a fact there's at the very least one person that's interested in getting into innocence work. And I suspect more than that. Um, and so I wonder if you could just briefly talk about kind of your career paths, how you got to where you are and, and you know, why you continue to do the work. And, um, I think we're probably kind of the denominator here is we've all been public defenders. I'm not sure if you ever, I know you're. I am now. I am a public defender now, but I was not before. Um, so when anybody comes to me and asks for career advice about what they should be doing, you know, I mean, if they want to get into um you know, innocence work or, you know, and, and what I do is strategic litigation is a little bit different, but the, um, is that I don't think you can really be an effective advocate in the criminal legal system. If you haven't stood next to somebody at arraignments night after night after night, and really had an understanding of the impact on entire communities, on entire families, on what volume looks like, what mass incarceration looks like, and, you know, and up for and personal 
So I really commend all of you to start the public defender shop. You know, I mean, I, I rely on that experience every day, you know, I mean, and um, I'm not sure if there's a better way to start your career. You know, ultimately, I, I, I started on appeals and then went to trial work. That's kind of an unusual path. A lot of people start in trials and then go to appeals. But I think that both are really important uh, for different reasons, different types of advocacy. But I really learned more, I think, as a, an advocate for systemic change from doing trial work than appeals made me kind of more of like a cerebral work. But the, um, I think that's what I would commend. Yeah, like we have to go to the other innocence lawyer first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I started out in private practice, and it really was sort of happenstance. I knew I wanted to do criminal defense, and I happened into a firm that specialized in appellate work and post-conviction work. I did a few trials, but it's sort of unusual that I started in that sort of end of the ocean. And for me, just practically speaking, um, I had small kids. I started my own. So I, I worked for a firm that did this kind of work. And then I started my own firm when my oldest daughter was three months old. And for me, post-conviction work made sense because the schedule was more forgiving than trial work where you're worrying about your Hicks deadlines and whatnot that, um, and when you're in trial, you're like in a submarine for that period of time. You really, you're just all day you're in court and then you're prepping for the next day. And it is, of your, your sort of siloed. And so for me, the work made sense with the fact that I had small children. Oddly, I guess that sounds weird, but being able to sit and read transcripts and go through that and sort of that for me um, was just sort of the right fit. And then, and that wasn't necessarily innocence work. It started out with sometimes guilty clients who didn't get a fair trial. And I loved for my, my sort of mindset, being able to pick apart what happened and, and what could have gone differently. So and for me, I just kind of fell into this work and then kind of continued along the path. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, so I am not, I think I've never been an lawyer. I have utmost respect for my innocent colleagues, but um, I'm a regular old defense attorney. And I'll tell you a little secret. I don't care about my kids. So I think the criminal legal system is racist, brutal, violent, inhumane. Um, overly is not even the right adjective. Um, I was home defender for about 10 years and it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. Don't send this video to my husband. Um, so I I loved every second of it. I agree that um, you know, getting to know a client and stand next to them, and frankly, like I, I mean it, it opened my brain in ways that I never had. Um, I would never have. I hope I would never would have sat in a jail um, without that experience, and then would have gone to a prison without that experience, and I spent countless hours, and then as some colleagues I know have as well, in jail for prison, see what it does. Um, in terms of forensic stuff, I learned pretty quickly what everything we were talking about, which is that it's ubiquitous. You can't do the work and not see it in your cases, and pretty quickly came to see that I had to start understanding it. And the more I learned it, the more flawed I realized it was. We all had our, our confessions of baby lawyering earlier, and my confession of baby lawyering is I thought that it was fine. I, I didn't know any better. I thought it was as reliable as everyone else did. And the more I looked and the more I saw, the more problematic I saw that it was, and um, sort of just took the approach of, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do it. And so that's the, the forensic I, just, I want to add one thing about innocence work. It's like, um, is that it's really, really, really hard to know, right? You know what I mean? Is that I've been wrong both ways a um, hundred times. And when, when I was a clinical law professor, what I would always say to my students about running for defense clinic, I'm sure Mika says the same, is that you weren't there. You don't know what happened. And there are facts that are provable and there are facts that aren't provable, right? You know what I mean? And, and that's really it. You know, what I mean, and and I think that you know, and and maybe you're skeptical hearing that, but I'll give you a really topical example. Is that the reason that we know that eyewitnesses are so unreliable, and that people can falsely confess, and that forensic sciences are often unreliable, is because of the work of the Innocence Project, and and beyond that. And this is before I got there. I'm not taking credit for any of this, but the is that the intake criteria was really really simple. This is when Professor Starger was there, right? You know, what I mean, is that they took any case that were biological evidence, if it was found and tested, 
would demonstrate innocence. So it didn't matter if there were 10 eyewitnesses, if there had been a confession, or there had been a bite mark match, or a hair, it didn't, none of that mattered. It was just if DNA could be found and tested, would it prove innocence? And that's how we know so much of what we're talking about. And that's how we know that, you know, but DNA is not available overwhelmingly, right? This idea that it's kind of everywhere or ubiquitous in the system is not really true because you're not going to spend that kind of money on your typical case. And most cases are not the kind of intimate murders and rapes that are the overwhelming majority of DNA exonerations, right? There are burglaries, drive-by shootings, all these other like types of crimes where biological evidence is not necessarily available, not necessarily gathered, not necessarily tested. So you can have a lot of unreliable verdicts, like the one I was just talking about with Charles McCrory in Alabama, where there's no DNA evidence. All we have is junk science. So I would be careful about standing back, you know, and deciding somebody's innocent or somebody's guilty, because as I say, and I'm sure we've all been wrong both ways many times. And at the end of the day, fighting for the people that you represent, um, uh, regardless, uh, is is rewarding in itself and, and, and brings you in, in touch with communities that you need to be in touch with. And I know that that's what really uh, drives everyone. So can you join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful presentation? Um, I guess we'll be hanging out a little bit here for folks that are able to hang out. Otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>